many screens to juggle here. Okay, that's us. Hi everyone, welcome to the Allied Air Force Research webinar for July. Um, apologies as we had to move the webinar um, to Thursday this month. I've actually been tied up the last few days um, with a client's family gathering and it's been absolutely exhausting. Um, so we had to move this to Thursday and thanks to Brian, Brian was able to, to juggle with us, so much appreciated. Um, as I said, I'd be obliged if you turn off your cameras and your sound until the presentation's over. It just helps keep the background noise to a minimum and hopefully then everybody can enjoy the event and there'll be no delays and no screens freezing either. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. I'm a professional genealogist for Treehouse Genealogy and you'll probably tell from the accent that I'm based in Scotland. I also run the Allied Air Force Research website. I was born into the RAF family and my own interest started um, when, I, when I researched my own Air Force relatives and it became a bit addictive from there. We're always happy to collaborate at Allied Air Force Research, um, so if you have a story to share with our audience, please get in touch. Alternatively, if you're struggling with your own research, feel free to reach out via our website and I will place contact details into the chat box for you. During this year, we have an amazing range of speakers for you and you can find out more about these talks via the website. I'll post a link for that as well and to we just let someone else in. I'll post a link for that into the chat box as well. If you take a moment to subscribe, we will send you an email by the term that details where you can register for all of this year's amazing events. And we'll also send you um, details of blog articles and some other bits and bobs as we go along. So our speaker this evening is Brian Fair. Brian is a military veteran originating from Lancashire. Following a 27-year career with the RAF, he settled in Milton Mowbray. His interest in mil military history stems from researching his own family history, which he started as a hobby back in 1990 at RAF Marham. During the COVID pandemic lockdown, Brian started his own History Fair website, producing blogs on local and military history subjects. And I'll post a link for Brian's website into the chat box so that you can check it out. In his spare time, Brian volunteers for the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission as a public speaker and a tour guide. His other passion is volunte volunteering for the War Memorials Trust, photographing and recording the condition of war memorials visited on his travels. Over 30 years experience researching his own family tree and that of his friends and his wife, the majority of his time is now spent researching military casualties buried in Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries um, or war memorials. Brian founded the Milton Mowbray Military History Group back in 2021 and since, since January 2022 the group has held monthly meetings with speakers about military subjects, the majority of which have a local connection to the area of Milton Mowbray. His presentation this evening, The Balloons Going Up, tells the story of 2nd Lieutenant Elfric Ashby Twydale. I hope I've got that right, Brian. Uh, Brian, it's lovely to see you. I'll let you unmute now. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Uh, yeah, you got it right. It's a, certainly a strange name, Elfric. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you share your screen. Um, if everyone can stay on mute and your camera's off, any questions for Brian can be asked at the end. And I'll hand over to you, Brian. OK, thanks a lot, Claire. Hopefully you can all see that now. We can, yeah. Yeah, marvellous. Um, yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, as Claire mentioned, I'm ex-RAF, um, military historian in my spare time. I uh, did 27 years in the Air Force, served all over the UK in the Falklands. Um, I run a local military history group. Um, it was originally called the Melton Mowbray Military History Group. It, it's now my own business now as History Fair. Um, we put monthly talks on. We have guest speakers. Um, we cover basically every theatre of war, every era uh, from First World War, Second World War. Um, I mean, the, the talk next week is going back to the war, the Wars of the Roses. So like I said, we sort of cover everything. 
the initial plan was to try and keep it local to Melton Mowbray. Um, but obviously, such with it being a small market town, we can't go on forever talking about Melton. So we sort of try and keep it localish to county based, but we do have um, other talks as well, just to keep the interest going. I mean, for example, one of the talks I did was the Freckleton Air disaster, which is where I grew up in Lancashire. Um, and then I did a talk this year on the RAF's particip participation in the Falklands because it was the 40th anniversary. But as I say, majority of the talks are um, connected with Melton or the local area. I started researching family history, um, like I say, about 30 years ago when I was at RF Morham, and I've been doing it ever since. And it's one of those you get stuck into. You might do five minutes on it, or you could end up doing hours on it at night. And I also, as, as Claire mentioned, I'm a volunteer for the Commonwealth World Graves Commission as a public speaker, uh, tour guide, and do the eyes on hands on, which is cleaning the graves and re reporting on the condition of them. And I also volunteer for the War Memorials Trust, and it was sort of that that side of it that got me into tonight's talk when I was researching my local uh, war memorial. And I was, I can't remember if it was Ancestry or, or um, Find My Past I was on. I think it was Find My Past. And I was going through the newspapers because I was struggling to find uh, details about a casualty listed on the war memorial. And basically, I came across this entry uh, in the local newspapers and I thought, well, that's strange because I've not come across that name on any of the memorials at all. And the more I got looking into it, the more of an interesting um, subject it became to me. So I, as you say, this is an article from the Leicester Journal um, from the Friday, the 4th of May, 1917. And this is how it all started. Um, like I say, Melton Mowbray, Captain E.A. Twidell, RFA. Uh, Royal Field Artillery attached to the Royal Flying Corps, killed on April the 22nd. So, I, as, I, as I said, I'm ex Royal Air Force, so predominantly my, my interest is predominantly RAF, but I, I do look at other stuff as well. And obviously, this is a local connection because it mentions Melton Mowbray, um, grandson of Mr. Ashby Twidell, or eldest son of Mr. Ashby Twidell from Niagara Falls in Ontario, and grandson of the late Reverend Joseph Twidell who was the a vicar in Melton Mowbray. So this is a chap who we're talking about tonight, Elfric Ashby Twydale. He was born on the 11th of June, 1890 in Quebec in Canada. And here we have this lovely photo of him in his Royal Field artillery uniform. And you can see the RFA badges on, it, on his collars there. And as we saw in the previous slide, the newspaper article states he was serving with the RFA but it was attached to the Royal Flying Corps. So during the research, I came across this, um, this family photograph, which was taken in Niagara Falls in Ontario in September 1910. And on the photo at the back standing is Catherine Twydale on the left hand side. She's aged 16. Elfric, the man we're talking about tonight at the centre at the back, he's aged 18. And Ashby Twydale, who's his father on the right hand side. Uh, seated, we've got his sister Wilhelmina, age 10, Clara, his mother, and Mowbray Twydale, age four. Now, Mowbray Twydale is a bit of a strange name, but obviously it's a, a connection back to, to where the family come from, Melton Mowbray. Because the father, um, Ashby Twydale, was actually born in Melton Mowbray. And Ashby Pearson Twydale was the actual name. And he was a timber merchant by trade, as I say, born in Melton. And he was the fifth child of the Reverend Joseph Twydale. In the late 1880s, Ashby emigrated to Canada. And where on the 3rd of June 1891, he married a Canadian lady, Clara Wilhelmina Heinrichs. Now, you might think that's a bit of a strange name for a Canadian. But yes, her father was, was Peter, but he was a native of Germany. So Elfric's grandfather, the Reverend Joseph Twydale, he was a long-standing rector of over 50 years at the Melton Mowbray Congregational Baptist Church. Now, this church actually closed quite a few years ago, um, about in 1980s, 1990s, I think it was, when, when they built a new one in, just on the outskirts of town. So it's not actually a practicing church anymore. And the, the war memorial that was in this church was moved to the, to the new building. So Elfric, 
he was educated at the Ottawa and Niagara Falls Public Schools. And then in 1910, he went to the University of Toronto, where he studied for a Bachelor of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering. When he was 22, in 1914, he joined the 44th Lincoln and Welland Regiment, which was part of the local uh, militia. Now, uh, the image you see on the left-hand side is the cap badge that they used to wear. And then the, the coloured one on the right-hand side there is the, the current or the modern version of it. As you see, you've got the king, king's crown and the queen's crown to highlight the difference. So on the 6th of August 1914, Elfric was now a sergeant with the 44th and they were placed on active service for local protection duties as part of the Welland Canal Force. So the Welland Canal Force was set up to protect the Welland Canal, which is a ship canal in Ontario, Canada, and it connects Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. And the idea behind this is it allows ships to pass through the two lakes without having to go through the Niagara Falls. And at the time it was seen, it was deemed to be vitally important to shipping to keep it open. However, the following year, Elfric enlisted into the Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force. He enlisted on the 8th of April, 1915. He was now aged 24. He joined um, a unit called the Canadian Mach Machine Gun Brigade. His service number was 651. Um, and he actually served with the number two Eaton motor machine gun battery. Now, when I spoke to people about this unit, the Eatons, they, see, they get confused. If anybody's a, a fan of the Jam and the Eaton rifles, it's not them. Uh, they was a cadet corps of Eaton College. And that song itself is about the rivalry between boys at Eton College and the neighbouring working class school boys. Paul Weller himself actually attended Shearwater Comprehensive School, which was located quite close to Eton. So I'm presuming that yeah, when, when he was at school, there was a bit of rivalry between the, the two classes of, of students. Um, so that was E-T-O-N, as in Eton Rifles, but this is E-A-T-O-N, the Eton Machine Gun Battery. So the Eatons were formed in January 1915 under the command of Major W.J. Morrison. They were named after Sir John Eaton, who had given $100,000 for the purchase of quick-firing machine guns mounted on armoured trucks. Uh, and this paid for 15 guns and the government supplied 25. So this is an example of one of the, one of the vehicles. Um, they're obviously learning, learning to drive it. I mean, at the moment, you can see the driver hanging out the side there. Um, I presume, obviously, when it's in battle and whatever, he's tucked inside safely and he looks out of the, the the slot just in front of him, as in that bit there. So according to his attestation papers, uh, prior to joining the army, Elfric was a chemical engineer. And whilst at Toronto University, he was a member of their track team who were intercollegiate champions in 1913. Uh, the Eaton's unit recruited mainly from Toronto and appealed to motor mechanics, drivers and athletes. So as we say, um, his job before was a chemical engineer. So it could be because he was in engineering and he was an athlete, whether it was, it was recruited for this or it, that's what attracted him to it. We don't know, but obviously he ended up in the motor machine gun in the Eatons. So on the 4th of June 1915, Elfric, along with 263 other ranks and 24 officers, embarked for England on the RMS Metagama. Now, this ship was part of the Canadian Pacific North Atlantic Service and remained in service with them throughout the First World War. However, on the excuse me, on the eastbound crossings, she carried Canadian troops in the third class accommodation. So she was still a civilian passenger ship, but on the eastbound journey, she was carrying Canadian troops, bringing them over to England. So this photo is, um, Elfric's not on this, but this is a photo of the Eton 
Motorised Machine Gun Brigade at Shorncliffe Camp in 1915. Um, it looks a lovely place, lovely tented accommodation there with, with the bell tents. Um, the Eatons themselves, they arrived at Devonport in Plymouth on the 14th of June 1915. And from Devonport, they proceeded to the Shorncliffe Military Camp, which was known as Caesar's Camp or St. Martin's Plain near to Folkestone. Um, because of all the Canadians that was there at the time, it was also known as a suburb of Toronto. So this is another another image, and this is a pre pre war, pre First World War image uh, of St Martin's Plain. And really, when you look at that image compared to the previous one, nothing really has changed. You've still got all the same bell tents and everything like that. As I say, it was set up in April 1915 as a Canadian training division for the second Canadian contingent to come over. Um, when, when they first arrived, they went, or the, the first contingent went and set up camp on Salisbury Plain. But the experienced difficulties there, such as excessive rain, lots of mud, and people were suffering from exposure to the, to the rain and the wind and that from the first contingent. So what they decided to do was move from Salisbury and set up camp at Shorncliffe. As I say, this is a pre-World War One image, but not a lot's changed. If you just go back to the previous one, you can still see all the same sort of tents being used in that. Shorncliffe itself as well, apart from being a training camp for the Canadians, was also used as a staging post for troops destined for Western Front due to its location. Uh, for those of you who don't know, as the crow flies, I mean, it's, basically it's on the south coast down in Kent, but as the crow flies, it's only 90 miles from Ypres, which isn't far at all. And quite often when you read the reports and um, people's memories or whatever, they could, quite often people hear or say that they could hear the guns going off over, over on the Western Front. Now, within a month, um, it would appear that he made the most of his arrival in the UK. As just four weeks later, he was at it, admitted to the hospital for 33 days receiving treatment. Um, he got venereal disease and gonorrhea. So you can see there, obviously, there's his details. Private Twydale, uh, Eton Machine Gun Battery, 657, service number. St. Martin's Plain is the camp he was on, and the diagnosis of gonorrhea. So that was on the 19th of July. And then on the 20th of August, he was discharged back to, back to, his, back to his unit. And the image on the right hand side here is the Canadian War Hospital down at Shorncliffe. This is an, another shot of a, a different type of the motorised machine gun carriage. Um, so you can see the driver sat in the front there. And obviously you've got two what look like Vickers machine guns mounted on tripods in the back. Quite unusual, honestly, until I started researching this story, I've never come across those before. So whilst at Shorncliffe, Alfred was promoted and he became a signalling sergeant and at some point later became a sergeant major with the unit. And whilst in England, he applied to his commanding officer, Captain Knight, for a commission in the new army with the Imperial Forces. So that's the, the new British Army. This request was granted and he was struck off strength from the Eatons on the 19th of November 1915 due to being granted a commission with the Royal Field Artillery in the new army. So as you can see, this is an extract uh, from the London Gazette on the 25th of November 1915. And it says the under mentioned to be second lieutenant on probation dated 20th of November 1915. And there it is, Elfric Ashby Twydale with the Royal Field Artillery. When he, when he um, joined the Royal Field Artillery, it was a second lieutenant um, with C Battery of the 64th Brigade. And he went to France in 1916, April 1916, serving on the Western Front from Whaley to the Holland's Island Redoubt and at the Somme up to Longueville and Ashenvilliers. This is another entry from the London Gazette, this time 25th of November 1916. Uh, recording a promotion to acting captain 
whilst commanding a trench mortar battalion. And he held this rank until 26 November 1917, when he relinqu relinquished his rank uh, due to no longer commanding the trench mortar battalion. Now, I've not found any records as to why um, it was no longer commanding. So we don't know whether it, it was uh, posted back out, sent back to his originating unit, or whether he got fed up with it and asked, asked for a change. But if any of you have never seen a uh, trench mortar before, that's an example there, and they're quite big beasts. So I won't like lugging one of those shells in, load, loading the mortar on one of them. But that's an example of the unit he, he was commanding. So whilst in the trenches on the Western Front, quite a common sight would have been the, the balloons the, from both British or German observation balloons in the sky. And they, they was launched up to observe enemy movements. So it would appear that is, um, after his stint with the Trench Mortar Battalion, as we say, he transferred to the Royal Flying Corps. And he took up a role as an observer serving with the number 16 kite balloon section, which was based in the area around Arras, uh, which is sporting 7th Corps. Now, the balloons themselves, um, and again, this surprised me when I started looking into it, was they've been around for quite a while. So this image is from the, uh, the Battle of Fleurus, which took place on the 26th of June, 1794 during the French Revolutionary Wars. And it was an engagement during the, the wars of the First Coalition between the First French Republic and the Coalition Army, including Britain, Hanover, Dutch Republic, and the Habsburg Monarchy. Um, so this is when balloons were first used. It was the first battle of history that incorporated aerial reconnaissance and observation of enemy forces via balloons. Um, but it didn't go too well, to be honest. Um, the, the commanding officers basically didn't like the idea and they said when they got got up um, there was too high to to note anything of useful reconnaissance value sort of thing so the French sort of really didn't bother with it for a few years after that however come to the first world war um, this is really the, the high point for the British military using balloons um, the British had actually been using them as well in South Africa during the Boer War. But at the time, we were still using these spherical shaped balloons. Now, these images you see here, um, so you can see the river winding, winding through here. That's the River Thames, apparently. And this was the, the Kite balloon training section um, over, over London. And this is where balloon observers and the captains commanders would be trained in commanding the balloons and trained in observation techniques. As it was a training school, they was actually quite often mistaken for defence purposes, but they were purely for, for training. And this image apparently is from December 1917. So during the war, First World War, the, the balloons um sort of changed shape and because it was found out that the spherical balloons weren't quite as stable and so they introduced these what they called sausage balloons kite balloons um, which were more aerodynamically shaped and stable and could operate in more extreme weather conditions compared to the the old spherical balloons and as we say, these, these were used over the Western Front for gathering intelligence and artillery spotting. The balloons themselves were fabric envelopes filled with hydrogen. They were controlled by cable attached to the ground, were often, uh, as I said, often known as sausages, sausage balloons. They were first used on the Western Front in 8th of May 1915. Each balloon, I mean, as you can see on the image there, there's quite a few guys on the ground around it. But each balloon was maintained and tethered by a team of 48 highly trained men. They carried two passengers, known lightheartedly as balloonatics. And these were a commander and an observer, who via a telegraph wire down to the ground would send back information on troop formations and artillery locations. So 
this is a an example of, of a basket um and it shows you a bit of, of what they've got so you they've got sand bags in them to weigh them down um communication equipment so you can see him with the headset on there you've got his microphone there and then around this down here you've got the cable going back to the telecoms cable which goes back to the ground uh they also have cameras binoculars uh pressure gauge code book barometer and an airspeed indicator and also two sheath knives uh and two lifesavers um you can see them wearing the lifesavers um, and also parachutes and the parachutes were in these here strung over the side of the basket so so they didn't actually wear, wear the parachutes themselves so as we say uh the men who who manned these balloons were called balloonatics that was the nickname they they earned themselves um what whether people thought there must have been mad going up on these but at the end of the day they was called balloonatics and as i say they had to use parachutes to escape when they're when the balloons were attacked by enemy fire so the parachutes are in in these on the side as we're just saying and these are called acorns now you can see from this photo this guy's got a rope tied around him and this comes down and basically it's connected to the bottom of the acorn and if they get in trouble then they jump over the side and hopefully um that length of rope is essentially their rip cord and it pulls the parachute and it is an example a cartoon of a balloon under attack and the crew jumping over the side so you see uh one guy's jumped his, his maps his binoculars whatever are going over the side he's jumping the other guy's climbing over you can see the rope going to the to the acorn there and the, the German aircraft in the background. So as I said, Elfric, Elfric Ashby Twydell was one of these balloonatics undertaking the role as an observer. Now, the Royal Flying Corps um, obviously evolved during, during you know, the years of the First World War. When it first went out in 1914, there was only probably about half a dozen aircraft and went up to hundreds of aircraft towards the end of the war but the techniques they were using like i say evolved over the months and the years it was there and for <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the rfc themselves actually carried out artillery spotting and photography of trench systems using both fixed wing aircraft and balloons the aircraft were also involved in bombing bombing enemy positions as well as patrolling their own front lines and aircraft along from the Royal Flying Corps, along with their observation balloons, were used in conjunction with rifle fire and trench mortars from infantry and artillery units to attack the German trenches, supply lines, and observation posts. So, as we said earlier, uh, Elfric was assigned to the 16th Balloon Section near Arras. And from the 9th of April to the 16th of May, the British were involved in a major offensive on the Western Front. Uh, known as the Battle of Arras, or the Second Battle of Arras, to be more precise. And this was the British Empire's part of a larger offensive planned by the French. Arras could both divert German attention from the French attack, launched further south along the River Rhine, and allow the British to test newly developed offensive tactics. As you can imagine, aerial observation was hazardous work. And for best results, aircraft had to fly at slow speeds and low altitude over the German defences, whilst kite balloons were essentially sitting ducks. It became even more dangerous with the arrival of Jaster 11 and the Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen in March 1917, when, the, when his squadron moved up to the Arras area. From the 16th of April, it was apparent that the French part uh, French attacks further, further south down the Aisne had not achieved a breakthrough. However, Field Marshal Haig continued to attack Arras in order to divert troops from the French on the Aisne. On the 20, 22nd of April, the day before the Second Battle of the Scarp, which was part of the bigger Battle of Arras, um, which, the Second Battle of the Scarp took place on the 23rd and 24th, Elfric was performing his duties as, as a lunatic. He would have been observing and recording enemy positions from his balloon basket. 
most probably observing actions on the front line and behind it, spotting an enemy troop movement or unusual activity of any sort, and reporting it back down to enable British artillery fire onto any worthwhile targets that he had identified. So due to their importance, kite balloons were usually given heavy defences in the forms of machine gun positions on the ground, anti-aircraft artillery and standing fighter patrols stationed overhead. All the defences included surrounding the main balloon with barrage balloons, stringing cables in the air in the vicinity of the balloons so that enemy aircraft will fly into them, uh, equipping observers with machine guns and flying balloons booby trap with explosives that could, remote, could be remotely detonated from the ground. These measures made balloons very dangerous targets to approach, but it didn't stop enemy aircraft attacking them. I mean, this is quite an interesting photo, really, because it obviously it shows the barren landscape. Um, I can't quite make it out whether it's a British or a French balloon, but you see all the people involved. But in the foreground, obviously, you've got graves of, of, of war casualties there. So this is a, a, a photo of a balloon that's, that's been been shot, been attacked. <coughs> Excuse me. In the early days of the war, balloons were occasionally shot down by small arms fire. But generally, it was difficult to shoot down a balloon with solid bullets, uh, particularly at the distances and altitude they was flying at. Ordinary bullets would pass straight through the balloons, um, basically putting a hole in the hydrogen gas bag and just making a hole in the fabric, but the balloon wouldn't blow up, it wouldn't ignite, it would just stay afloat. However, hits on the wicker card, the basket below it, could kill the observer or, or, the, or the commander, but it was not until special Pomeroy incendiary bullets and Buckingham flat-nosed incendiary bullets became available in 1917 that any consistent degree of success was achieved. So the guys in the balloons were called balloonatics, um, but the en enemy pilots that were trying to shoot them down were, were also had a nickname themselves, and they were called balloon busters. And as you may have guessed, unfortunately for Elfric, his kite balloon came under attack from a German balloon buster. Um, in an attempt to save his own life, he leapt over the side of the balloon basket. But tragically, his parachute didn't open properly, and he plummeted to his death. His body re was recovered and buried in the Bukoi Road Cemetery at Fishu, about nine kilometres from Aris. In November 1916, the village of Fishu was behind the German front line, but by April 1917, the Germans had withdrawn uh, and taken the line considerably east of the village. And in April and May, the 7th Corps main dressing station was posted there, ideally suited, located for the, the Battle of Aris itself. So for the British soldiers, the average daily loss rate at Arras was the highest of the war, just over 4,000, 4,076 it was. Total casualties amounted to 158,000 and the Germans lost around the same number. Now you may have all heard of Bloody April. Uh, this is a book by Peter Hart, uh, Slaughter in the Skies over Arras, 1917. The increased losses of the Royal Flying Corps personnel provided British air support during the Battle of Arras, resulting in becoming known as Bloody April. Um, during it, during the, that month, British lost 245 aircraft, 211 aircrew were killed or missing, and 108 were taken as prisoners of war. For the Germans themselves, they recorded their loss as 66 aircraft during the same period. Um, as a comparison, when you look at the casualties, for the British, um, when you look at the five months of the Battle of Somme in 1916, um, the Royal Flying Corps suffered 576 casualties during that period. Under Richthofen's leadership, Shasta 11, uh, they scored 89 victories during April, over a third of the British losses. Only 211 of those uh, casualties were related to air crew. However, when, when you do an investigation on the Commonwealth War Graves Casualty Database, it actually records 258 with the Royal Flying Corps who died during April. 
Well, that's for the whole. So that includes Egypt and everything, 258. Now, what I've not actually managed to, to identify is the figures quoted for Bloody April, whether that was just aircrew, as in you know, pilots and observers and that from fixed wing aircraft, or whether it also included, you know, like Elfric and the, the blue lunatics as well. Now, for any of you that's done any um, investigations, any research into any of this, um, when when you look at our archives, you, not a lot is publicly available. And um, for what records are held, you've either got to subscribe to certain sites like Ancestry or Find My Past, or um, go to the National Archives, where if they've not been digitised, you get charged for getting copies of them but with canadians and australians those two countries are brilliant all a lot of their records are publicly publicly available and this is just an example of one um that elfwick is commemorated in the national memorial album of canadian heroes and this is available online so thank you that's the that's the end of the presentation so has anybody got any questions? Um, obviously, if anybody would like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And then you've got my website down at the bottom of the slide there, historyfair.co.uk. That was amazing. <laughs> I was actually quite interested, um, Brian, to see the, the training camp. Um, I was actually looking up because I had actually researched a major who came over from Canada and, and, and actually ran that camp. Yeah. So, yeah, it's true what you say about the Canadian records. Another thing that I would say is that the Canadian war diaries are free. You can download them all. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're fantastic. But, yeah, I mean, Canadian and Australia, I, I actually think it's a shame, you know, that it's so much of a delight sometimes to research the Australians and the Canadians and that because of restrictions in this country, and access to records, it's so much more difficult to, to research our boys. It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, as, so I've got a question. Is Elfric um, listed on any of the memorials actually in Milton? Or no, he's not. No, no, he's no mention of it all anywhere. Okay. Yeah, it's like say, it's just in the local local newspapers it was mentioned, but yeah. unfortunately, not, it's not even on um, the memorial for the Baptist Church, which is... is uh, Grandpa was, was the vicar of for over, was it 40 or 50 years now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame that, because I, I mean, a yeah. lot of people who did move away sometimes, the, you know, the towns do make sure that they're remembered. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame. Does, well, obviously, obviously uh, Elfric wasn't from Melton, but his father was born in Melton and, and his granddad was still here. So, well, it, it was dead by the time of the First World War, but yeah, it, yeah. it was a well, well known vicar in town. Mm -hmm. Deborah says, thanks very much. Very interesting, but she's having to go. She's having to shoot off. Thanks for joining us today, Deborah. Does anyone else have any questions? You can turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Is everybody going quiet? Oh, Sarah says, I assume you've seen this file on the, at the National Archives. Right, Sarah, you're the one that dives into these records. What have you spotted? <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the one that I was telling you about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I must admit, I'm not sending it to the National Archives. I've, I've, um, I've got his file, which I downloaded from Ancestry. Right. You know, whether there's any any difference hmm, with that, and what the National Archives has got, I don't know. All right. So she's saying a, a W three three nine officers file. Okay. Yeah, looked? I'll have a look at that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're struggling, I'll give you Sarah's details, and I'm yeah, sure right, she, she can work something out to photograph it for you. Fantastic. I mean, I just think, I mean, my great uncle was in the Royal Flying Corps. So he, he was sort of over Passchendaele, um, kind of 17 and 18, I would say. But I mean, you just sort of think to yourself, aviation, you know, in World War One was just so new. And you just, I just can't get away from that. These troops on the ground looking up and seeing all this going on above them. It must have been like otherworldly at times. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah, I, I, a lot I mean, of them would never have seen anything like that before in their lives. No, they wouldn't, no. And I mean, like, as I was saying, the interesting thing for me is, as well as this, it's not just somebody serving the Royal Flying Corps, but 
which is obviously what got my attention initially, but it's clear how it progressed from the local militia to the machine gun battery to a trench mortar to the field artillery, then, then onto the flying course sort of thing. So he's had quite a, a wide, wide ranging career sort of thing. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's that as well is um, that, you know, people who went into the Royal Flying Corps often came from, you know, army regiments or, so you might find that their, their, war, their army records are not, they're in the burnt records that you perhaps, yeah, yeah. you know, but you maybe will get their RAF record, which will yeah. give you a bit more information. Um, so Sarah's saying as well, extensive World War One Royal Flying Corps RAF war diaries at the National Archives. Yeah, I, I must admit, I've not looked at the war diaries yet for 16 Kite Balloon Squadron. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's like I say, it's one of those that's continually dipping in for more research, shall we say? So, I'll give you Sarah's um, email address, and you can. <laughs> 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 that's that's right. <laughs> you might be able to add more to the story. So, yeah, yeah. The, other, the other thing that I'm curious to know is, you've got quite a lot of photographs. Did you manage to contact anyone that was related to them? Or? No, I no, no, a lot of them. Um, I've sort of borrowed from. There's a few on Ancestry, mm -hmm. but a lot of them came from the Canadian Virtual War Memorial. Right, yeah, which is a great On that, family and relatives can upload their own photos and that. I mean, obviously, there's some I got from newspaper clippings and things like that myself, but like yeah. the family family ones was, was on the Canadian Canadian Memorial thing. Yeah, just shows how you can actually build yeah. a decent story of someone's yeah. service and their life as well. But no, fantastic, really interesting, Brian. Um, I don't. I, I mean, it's not a job I would have fancied myself going up in those balloons. I don't know about oh, you. No. <laughs> well, it's probably alright going up in the balloon, but when you're being shot at and I know, I know and that's an early part. You jump out with a, a bit of rope tied around you. No, 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 definitely not. Okay, so thank you so much for your talk. It's been that's really right. Um, I'll, I've posted details of Brian's website into the, the chat box and for anybody watching on YouTube I'll, I'll certainly update that as well. Um, let me just post it again. Go over and I think have you got a subscription option on it as well? I'm not sorry. Uh, have you, on your website? Can people subscribe to your website? Yeah, yeah. So click subscribe and then as and when new blogs go up they'll get notification. Yeah, yeah so head over to Brian's um, website and subscribe. Let me just post some details as well for the next presentation. So our next webinar is back to a Wednesday again. It's Wednesday the 30th of August at 7pm. The speaker will be Martin Barrett, who will provide a presentation, The Fickle Hand of Fate, Survival Over the Ruhr and on the Ground for RAF Bomber Aircrew in World War II. You can register now to attend this webinar and I've just placed the details into the chat box. Um, we also have an amazing relationship with Pen and Sword Books, um, and as you know, we do interview a lot of their authors. They stock an amazing range of aviation books. Um, you know, I just can't stop looking at them and buying lots of them as well. So head over there. I've put some details into the chat box where you can. Especially when they've got the sales on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they do some amazing sales and yeah. certainly ebooks and things as well. So it saves on you yeah, a lot of shelf space as well. <laughs> Um, and if you're on Facebook, check out the Allied Air Force Research Group. It's an amazing place to have a chat about what you're researching, get some second opinions and also meet like-minded like people. And I've placed some details into the chat box for that as well. Um, I hope everyone's having a lovely summer and that you continue to do so. The weather, unfortunately, in Scotland has been very rainy, but nothing new there. <laughs> No, it's, it's been like that down here as well. So, I mean, it's lovely blue sky at the moment, like, but... <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad we are not the only ones in, Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again so much for your presentation, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. And for everyone that's joined us, thank you so much um, for your time, and we look forward to seeing you all again next month. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.